about it. Okay, okay so we are live and you're going to hear Siri say um, this meeting is being recorded or something like that. And that's that's your time to go. Okay, Leah. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome on this wonderful Tuesday, March 3rd, 2022. I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. And you know, you should stop and give yourselves a pat on the back because you stopped in the middle of your day. Some of you may be at work, some of you, you may be on the go, but you said, this might be important. I might learn something. I'm gonna hop on to the Way to Wow show. So thank you for joining and taking the time. And I wanna thank our producer, Rabbi Kevin Bemmel for uh, giving this show such love and attention and always making sure to bring content to individuals. And today we're gonna to provide a lot of value. You know, the reason for these shows is to help people learn in a fun way, in an informative way, the basic stuff about how to build financial freedom, how to be prepared with all life's uncertainties. And we're gonna bring different guests, different weeks to bring you the up and coming, the latest and the greatest information on every um, idea that you could imagine. So stay tuned for more things. But today we have a special guest with us and I'm excited to bring to you um, his, his mind, his talent, his experience. We have Jeff Condon here with us all the way from Santa Monica. He's a Santa Monica native. <laughs> uh, a little bit about Jeff and I am so thrilled to to get to know you personally and then have everyone else here with us today. He is an experienced attorney um, in estate planning and he is also an incredible author. In fact, the Wall Street Journal calls his book, um, I'm gonna, I don't wanna mince words, <laughs> right? So best-selling inheritance related book in America by far. Now that's a serious <laughs> business. It's titled Beyond the Grave. I don't think I've ever heard a better title than that. And really helping families prepare you know, their trust, setting it up properly. There's so much that comes along with it. I know I don't just have questions. I know our guests will have questions for you too, Jeff. And so, you know, he's an incredible dad. Like I mentioned, 30 years, um, over 30 years with his practice in Santa Monica. And there's so much wisdom here to share. So um, I guess my first, I would love to just dive in to the, to the content. I think I would like to start by asking you, Jeff, what inspired you to get into this industry? What made you say, this is what I want to do? Uh, nepotism, Leah. How about <laughs> it's My dad uh, was a lawyer and the field of inheritances um, and avoiding conflicts in the inheritance arena. That was what my dad did. And uh, I, so I just went into the family business. Um, certainly the door was open for me, but I had to make myself, um, useful. So getting, you know, putting that foot in the door can only get you so far. And so I considered myself just like any other new employee, new lawyer at firm. I made myself, um, useful. I was a fly on the wall in my father's office to learn about how he handled, uh, particular inheritance situations and, what would happen in the, in, in the legal context after clients died and the kids came in and had meetings with my dad for advice on administering the plans and distributing the assets to the family, hopefully without any type of conflict or family divisiveness. So I, I'm fond of saying that if my dad had been practicing in small dog protection law, I would have done that as well. So there was an opening for me and that's what I did. And I uh, made that my career. And what I like about it is, you know, and this sounds trite, but it really is about helping people. It's helping people at a time in their lives when they most need a lawyer to guide them through a particular process. You know, I'm not suing corporations. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, a personal injury lawyer where we're trying to maybe extort the best settlement that can possibly be obtained for a client. Um, uh, not to say that, uh, that, that there isn't a value in that, but I like going to bed at night knowing that, um, that when people come to see me, it's the first time they, maybe they had to see a lawyer in their whole lives. You know, they haven't been sued, they haven't been divorced, they haven't established a corporation. So when they come and see me, I 
like that sense of appreciation that they have for what I can do for them. And I do enjoy doing what I do for them in this arena because uh, folks need help in this. They may not realize it, but right. they need help in, uh, in coming up with the proper plan to yeah. leave their money and their property to their children and grandchildren and other heirs in the right way. So I know I'm, you know, you ask me yeah. one question, I'm going on for 20 minutes, but I no, really do I enjoy it. helping people. I really do enjoy helping people. And uh, I could tell. Yeah, yeah, in, in this tell. in this avenue, sure, yeah. And and piggybacking off how you just ended, you know, the, leaving it in the right way, you know, of all the greatest hits, right? And I say that twofold. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. you talk about doing it the right way. What are some of the wrong ways? What are some of the right ways in leaving inheritance to your children? Well, it's such a, it's it's such an an open-ended question because uh, there are just so many pitfalls that can befall a family in this context, in the inheritance context, that can inadvertently work to destroy families, make it so that they will never speak to each other again. And we've seen what happens um, with, with family fallout that comes as a result of a plan gone wrong. You see, I start, you know, I was in this practice with my dad and my dad over a number of years had established a clientele of hundreds of hundreds of folks. And when I came into the firm, that was when the clients that my dad had obtained started being in what my dad called the dying time of life. And we got to see the real lessons, the real examples of what happens when clients pass and children divide the inheritance. Before then, it was just all theory because it was just words on paper until they started to die off. And then we had the real experience of seeing what happened. And from those experiences, from that school of hard knocks, because there's no class in law school that can teach you how to avoid inherit, how to recognize and resolve inheritance conflicts after parents die. But from those examples, we got to see really the, 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 the questions to ask, the, 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 the issues to take into consideration that we never considered before. And from those examples of, of what happened um, when, cl when clients died, we were able to come put together sort of a greatest hits. That's, I think that's what you were alluding to, a greatest hits of what to do and what not to do in the inheritance arena in order to keep families together. And that's what our, that's what our, our philosophy is. There's some, there's some people just don't care. You know, some people say, Hey, I don't care what, what happens with my kids after my, you know, after we die, whatever happens, happens, you know, we do what we want with our inheritance plan. That's the end of it. And that's great. Okay. That's certainly one viewpoint, but our viewpoint or the one that I, that my father had, the one he instilled in me was our children are our most precious possessions and our, the inheritance plan is the last great lesson that you will leave to your children after your death. And wow. if that lesson plan goes sour, so too will the relationship between your children be sour as well. And that's not, and if, you, if people think about it, they're saying maybe that's not how we wanna do it. So what does Condon have to say about making sure that, the, that this great lesson doesn't go sour? Okay, there, there are some basics. There are some, some, some ascent, uh, ones that I would say that whenever I bring them up, um, I get a slew of people saying, gee, we better ch change our inheritance plan to ensure that it does X or it doesn't do X. And the first thing that comes to mind in this greatest hits of making sure that the inheritance plan does no harm to the family after passing is to name, is to make sure that your inheritance plan names all of your children as your after death transfer agents after uh, after you pass. Thank you. But, uh, by the way, can you still see me? Because I don't yes. see you. We you see, okay. I see you, I hear you. I'm taking some of these important nuggets oh. and I'm writing them down. You know, this okay. is so valuable, Jeff. I, I'm so grateful that we have you here and I'm glad that the audience is, is here with us because some people might just name their oldest child or their most responsible child who might be child number four or, or two, right? And so that's a very important lesson. I'm sure you'll t dive into that a little bit more and share why is it so important. Marie Carole, please mute yourself. Marie Carole, please mute yourself. 
um, because why, you know, tell us a little bit about more should, why would you name all children? What if you have a disabled mm -hmm. child? Do you still want them named on there? Well, you know, we have to look at the reality of what the facts are presented to us in order to see if we're going to deviate from this sweeping generalization that you should name all of your children as your after death agents in the in using the term the, the correct terminology you know most uh, most of your clients most of my clients have living trusts and the living trust inheritance instructions are carried out by your successor trustees or your after death transfer agents because they're the ones in charge of transferring assets from your trust after your death to the live beneficiary and more often than not, those after-death transfer agents are going to be your children. So we're saying you should name all your children as your after-death transfer agents in your living trust, because what are the consequences of not naming all your kids in the, in the main? Well, the consequences are that if you uh, name just one, then the children who are out of power may make your power child's life miserable, questioning every decision he or she makes. And we're not even uh, discussing beneficiaries. We're just discussing making sure the beneficiaries get, and, and so my question would be, what if mm -hmm. the beneficiary information differs, is unequal? What, mm -hmm. if, what are some of the pitfalls you've seen in that situation? Well, that's, that's interesting uh, because, you know, if, if you're going to name all your children as your after-death agents, their job is to transfer to the beneficiary. So the children will essentially transfer it to themselves. And there's, and if everything's in equal shares, there's not really a problem, usually, usually. But if you just name one child, um, then, you know, that child has a lot of power, the power to decide what distributions will take place, when the distributions will take place, the power to decide what each child's equal share will consist of, the power to decide which age, which CPAs will be used, which lawyers will be used. There's a lot of power. And what do you have on what do you have uh, on the other side? You have the uh, on those children who are not in power on the outside looking in. But Jeff, and, I have a question on that. I apologize yeah. for interrupting. It's OK. Does that mean all children have to agree, because what if it takes them two yeah. years to come up with the right you know, plan of action? Do this doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that they all need to wait until they all come to an agreement. Well, that's an excellent point, Leah, because um, naming, you know, uh, my advice of having of, of the clients naming all their children as the after death agents would seem to go against a smooth and efficient after death transfer process. And, yeah, I can see where somebody will say, well, Jeff, I've got three kids, you know, too many kids spoil the broth. I just want one in charge or say, hey, Jeff. Um, I just want, um, you know, I have a, uh, a child who's in business, the other kids, they're not in business. And I think that my business child will be uh, uh, better equipped to do this. And that makes a lot of sense. But when you have, but when you have this power, the, the, this, this, this unequal sharing of power, that the, you know, you have to look at it as a weighing process. Are the problems that may arise by not naming all your children as the agents going to be greater than the ones that, that than the problems that present itself by having to have all of the kids on there as the agents in order and having to get all the signatures to make any type of transfer move. My experience has been, my experience has been that even though all the children, let's say it's three kids, all of them are named as successor trustees, there's going to not be so many problems. Why? Because even the most recalcitrant, even the, the child with the laden with the most family baggage is going to realize, hey, wait a minute. If I make, if I throw a monkey wrench into the works and I make a big deal about it, something that really there's no, you know, there, there, there's, you know, there's no substance there, but, you know, uh, my, you know, but my siblings were mean to me when I was a kid and I'm going to be mean back you know, this is the stuff of family baggage that's coming to bear. But even the most, okay, even the most resentful, recalcitrant child is going to say, if I do that, if I just screw things up because I feel like it or I disagree, then that's just going to delay me getting my share. Or Correct. I'm going to have or a lot of my share is going to be going in attorney's fees. So yeah. I, I you know, th there's that saying, you know, from that movie, Wall Street, greed is good. Greed works. 
greed really works in the inheritance arena that to, to make it so that all of the kids will get along to discharge the duties of successor trustees, sign all the documents that are necessary to transfer the assets to themselves as equal beneficiaries. Hopefully it's equal. Well, that's and my, in my mind, question. <laughs> it, yeah, and in my mind, that is, the, you know, that, that, that solves a lot of problems. Greed really solves a lot of problems. I know I'm using it. In I'm actually going to write that down because that's, yeah. that is important. Well, yeah. speaking of creating um, unequal, you know, between the children in mm -hmm. an inheritance plan, do you treat children unequally in an inheritance plan? Well, there's two ways that clients will treat children unequally in the inheritance plan. There's the inadvertent way, and then there's the intentional way. Oh. The intentional way is easy to recognize. It's when parents would say, Jeff, you know, our, our, our daughter doesn't need it as, uh, as much as our son. So we're going to leave most of it or all of it to our son. And I'm sure that uh, our daughter won't mind. Um, well, you know, it, it, in, in, there's, there's a phraseology that we use in this office. That's punishing daughter's success and, re, uh, and rewarding the son's failure. And wow, that is very I, uh, powerful. Repeat yeah, that for and, the audience again. That's very powerful. Yeah. Pun well, well, yeah, it's punishing the successful child's success and rewarding the, uh, uh, the, the other child's, when I say failure, meaning not as successful as the Correct. successful sibling. Um, but it's a phraseology that, that we use that really brings that point home. And more often than not, when we have a situation like that, the clients present, we, we ask the client to, could you, uh, could you bring in your successful child, or at least not with us, but into the conversation about being left less because of that child's success? Wow. And a lot of times the, you know, first of all, the parents may say, no, we're not going to, this is our decision. We're not going to bring our child. And okay, that's their decision. I have a whole chapter on, <laughs> on, you know, should you tell your child about your inheritance plan? The answer is unqualifiedly yes. But, um, but um, if they do tell their child, child, the successful child that he's, that he or she is going to be getting less or maybe getting cut altogether just because he or she is more successful. Uh, the answer is going to be either a bow jest, which is a kind of a fake. Yeah, that's OK. Whatever you want to do, it's your plan. Who am I to dictate what your plan should be? Um, or it's are you kidding me? I busted my butt, you know, trying to bring success to myself and honor to my family by my success. And what have you done? You have punished my success. So I want um, to make you proud. And yeah. that's how you reward me. Exactly. Exactly. And then, and then there's of course the, the just cutting out a child because you don't like what that child's doing with your, with, with his or her life. You know, you may love your child, but you don't love what he or she does. So you say, well, I'm just not going to let my money, the inheritance that he or she gets, get caught up in that child's problems. The first thing I would say to that is, you know, you don't have to cut out that child just because you don't like what that child's lifestyle is, whatever that is, whether it's drugs, alcohol, crazy cults, you don't like the, the, the you know, your child's spouse. You know, there's all kinds of reasons we've heard for cutting out a child. We say that, well, then why don't you just leave that child his or her share, but leave it in a protection trust with a third party as trustee so you can ensure that the money and property is being properly used the way that you want it to be used. That is a little bit of control from the grave, but that's instead of the drastic step of cutting out uh, a, a child. But if you're cutting out a child because you are estranged from that child or, or for whatever reason, then you have to think about two things. One, you have to know that when you cut out a child, you may be dumping that child into your other children's lives with wow. that other child, with, with that, with that cut out child saying, hey, I didn't get my third. I didn't get my half, whatever it was. And you two got it. So you two siblings got it. So now you have to take care of me. And uh, that could make your other children's lives pretty miserable. Um, but the other one is if you are going to cut out that child, you got to do it right. I've got a bunch of cases. I got one right now where, you know, a, a, a you know, mom uh, had between, you know, between uh, adopted kids, stepkids, foster kids, you know, like 15 15 kids, but she wanted all of it to go to one, to one. 
So I said, okay, if you're going to do that, you got to do this. You got to get a letter from your doctor saying that you are, that you are a, a clear mind and concise thought. Um, you have to get, um, write a letter to me stating that, you know, why you want to just leave everything to the one child. And we may audio tape or videotape the signing ceremony. So when, after the client dies, when the cut out children or child announce that, that they've got a lawyer and that the lawsuit's going to be brought, um, we give all this information to the, the, those attorneys and that usually ends the lawsuit. Um, and that lawsuit would be based on incapacity or undue influence or whatever. But with all this information, you know, audio, letters, doctor's letters, and maybe even a psychiatrist examination a report, you know, if the clients are willing. We throw all that out, that ends the lawsuit. But Leah, that's the intentional way of cutting out a child. That's, that's, let's talk about how you inadvertently cut out a child, or excuse me, leave, leave, a, uh, leave a, uh, your children an unequal inheritance. Right. In, in this category, you know, mom, you know, your clients, mom and dad, whoever, they have a plan that leaves everything equal, you know, one third each. Okay. So that, that seems to be equal. What, where's the problem? Where's the inadvertence? The inadvertence comes when the parents don't realize your clients don't realize. And I get this. And I know that there's a, there's a, a real divergent viewpoint on this, but when the, from the child, from the children's perspective, from their perspective, when they're receiving an equal inheritance, it ain't equal to them if the parents have not treated the children roughly financially equally during the parents' lives. Because I promise you, Leah, that when children, when parents die, and I've seen this in countless meetings, seriously, I, you know, uh, it, it's you know, not exaggerating, that the, ki- the children will take into account all lifetime gifts that the parents made to the children during the parents' lives. And even if the inheritance plan says equal distribution, it's still not equal from the kid's perspective, unless there was rough approximation uh, or, or uh, a, r- a rough attempt to equalize during the parents' lifetimes. And, um, and I understand- How do you correct that? How do you correct that? Well, you have, you, to rec- that? you have to recognize the problem first. My dad used to say 95% of the solution to any problem is recognizing the problem in the first place. Well, so like one the of the problem que- was before they died. <laughs> exactly. So one of the questions that we never asked, my dad never asked this until he saw a slew of clients die and then saw this in, in, in a slew of situations where this situation came up. And so, uh, and we saw this, that this worked to destroy families where the children who did not receive greater, you know, uh, uh, lifetime gifts, you know, it's the, co- the common example is three kids, you know, mom and dad sent one of them to some sort of professional uh, school, doctor, lawyer, whatever. And the other kids did not go to a higher education or, you know, just got married out of high school, whatever. But, you know, when the parents died and everything goes equally, you know, they're going to start to do rough mathematical calculations. The parents are not. Because the parents, they don't see the relationship between lifetime gifts and, and the instructions in the inheritance plan. But the kids are. They're keeping, it, they, they're keeping an economic scorecard, even though the parents are not. And if that economic scorecard is not roughly equal when the parents die, the kids are going to be resentful. So we point this out to the clients when we're doing their inheritance plan. We didn't used to, but we saw what happened and we saw that this issue comes up. So we say, number one, have you made unequal lifetime gifts? And number two, if you have, do you care about equalization? Wow. Oh, no, Mr. Condon, that's not. No, we really don't. You know, you know, our, you know, our money is our money. We, we treat our kids how we treat them. And, you know, they're lucky to get anything. And, uh, you know, so just equal. OK, fine. They're making an informed decision. Great. But when we raise this issue, a lot of times parents say, you know, we never really thought about that before. And maybe we should do something to equalize. Wow. And whatever that plan is, you know, uh, like, you know, th- there's a whole bunch of solutions, whether it's giving more to the other kids now to equalize or leaving additional shares in the inheritance plan to the other kids uh, who didn't get the greater lifetime gifts. Um, you know, uh, or, you know, if the parents can't afford to equalize. Maybe they buy an insurance policy and the insurance policy beneficiaries are the kids who got the shorter end of the stick. There's all kinds of solutions. 
But the point is recognize the issue. And this is how, this is how children are inadvertently treated unequally. Uh, yes. No, I think- Oh, I'm sorry, I thought there was a question pending. No, this yeah. is so valuable. You're bringing up really incredible points that I'm sure most people on this call, myself included, never even thought about, but it's so true and it makes so much sense. And it's really important, you know, some people on the call or some people listening to this might already have a trust in place and might even mm -hmm. go back and make adjustments. Um, mm -hmm. Or if you're about to set one up, take all of this into consideration and start thinking about ways that life insurance was actually a very, I heard recently, you know, someone said, mm -hmm. I don't really have a lot of money to leave my kids. I, I don't really want to think about a trust. I'm not quite sure. And a, a way that you can solve that is by, like you mentioned, um, you know, a death benefit to, to give them a love goodbye. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. I, uh, Leah, I'm not an insurance agent. I'm not in the business of selling insurance, but I can tell you that. And I talk about this in our books that life insurance can be a real good tool for a lot of inheritance planning situations and uh, uh, that uh, in which uh, situations arise, which could create conflicts. Like for example, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing this in my life. I'm getting, um, I was married before I have kids from a first marriage and I've, and I'm getting married uh, May 29th to, oh, I was lucky enough. Oh, thank you. I was lucky enough to meet a, just a terrific gal. And um, so I, you know, I'm in this business and I know for a fact that if I just do the traditional thing of leaving everything to my second wife for her life, then on her death, it goes to my kids. I know that there's an economic connection between my first kids and my second spouse. That's not such a great connection because now you have these first kids out there who just can't wait for this stranger to die before they can get their inheritance. Oh, um, and and uh, so what I've done is I bought a life insurance policy. And I named my my future wife as the uh, beneficiary of that policy. So when I die, she gets that policy. My kids get what they're going to get. They walk away. Everybody's fine. Nobody's having to rely on anybody else to die. Can we mute everyone? Um, mute themselves, please. Or Kevin, maybe you can mute Fred and Lisa. Thank you. I just unmuted you and, and uh, Jeffrey. So okay, I just unmuted myself. So Jeffrey, unmute yourself, please, because I think what Kevin did was he muted everybody. Um, so that is a great way to solve the problem, thinking ahead, making sure there's no animosity, hard feelings. Like you said, we're waiting for her, this, this person to pass so we can get our share. That was That's a really great strategy. And um, okay. speaking of that, you know, leaving assets to your, to your second spouse, and then to your children, is that what you would advise most people to do? I mean, I'm sure every situation is different. Yeah. It's a case by mm -hmm. case, but there are a lot of families that have second marriages, third marriages, mm -hmm. I'm sure that's yeah. something that comes up often. What other tips can you give to someone in that situation? Well, like I said before, it's important to recognize the issue because, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, you know, I'm gonna use myself as the example, just because it's easy for me to do that. Um, I'm going to, you know, if, you know, if I wasn't thinking about it, I would say, well, I'm just going to leave everything to my second wife for life. And then on her death, it goes to my kids because it's just like as if there was I was married to their mother and uh, would just require, you know, and they just have to wait for their mother to die, except that somebody else. But then we had the real experience of seeing what happened. Um, in these situations after clients died. And what you saw was this conflict between the first children and the second spouse. Uh, you, uh, you know, and time doesn't permit me to go into all those conflicts. One of them is income versus growth. You know, you have the second spouse who says, I want as much income from these assets as possible um, because I get income from them all. Uh, and the kids are saying, oh my God, forget that. We want growth. We want to know that these assets are at least keeping a, a pace with inflation. So you have that conflict and you have the, I can't, the conflict of, I can't touch. I, we, we don't get this, these assets until this stranger dies. We can touch the house. We can feel it. We can see it. We want to sell it so we can enhance our own lives, but we can't until this person dies. You know, I've had second wives tell me that whenever they get a call from their, uh, you know, from their stepkids, that they can sense an air of disappointment on the other end of the phone after they, they realize answer? that. And as you picked up the phone, it's like, oh, you're still alive. Uh, you know, how rude. 
So, but but it is situational. So, I don't but to laugh, but it's, it's no, no, no. This is yeah. uh, it, it's kind of it gets absurd. So, wow. but anyway, but there are, but uh, probably belaboring this point. But um, if this is a matter of concern, then we try to see what we can do to terminate that economic connection between the first spouse and the second children. Sometimes there's just not enough assets to make right. that, you know, to give some to one, give other, you know, give things to others, uh, to the other, whichever, whichever it is, um, you know, and then uh, if, if they're, you know, if sometimes not every problem has a solution because there may not be enough funds, maybe that the insurance premiums are too high. Right. So we're fond of saying if there's no solution to this problem, then, you know, gather the kids in the lawyer's office and let the lawyer just say, this is the way it is life. This is life in the big city. And you're just going to have to live with this. At least it won't be a surprise after, uh, after the connecting tissue parent dies, you know? So, um, but there's all kinds of solutions to that. Yeah. 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 Well, there, it, it's so detailed. And, you know, cause I, I know from years ago, I have a friend who has a sister. There's actually a, you know, a brother and three girls and two of the sisters don't talk due to what was inheritance mm -hmm. issues, I guess, parents not setting it up properly. And, mm -hmm. and it really does break up families. So what you're saying is so important. And I'm sure the parents did not have any intention of that, but mm -hmm. it just, they didn't have someone like you to sit with them and really show them the larger picture and especially looking into the future of what that can do. And, and yeah. more, more on that topic about leaving, you know, things to your children. What about leaving debt to your children, right? Um, how do you mm -hmm. not leave children in a, in a creditor debtor type of yeah. relationship? All right. Well, the, the, I would, I would uh, have this go under the category of making sure that your inheritance plan does not harm the relationship between your kids. Um, and as it, 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 this discussion involves the, you know, a not, not untypical situation where mom and dad have loaned money to a child during their lifetime because they wanted to help the child at the time the child needs help. And they said, okay, we know we're not going to give it to you. We don't, nobody gave us a free lunch. So we're going to loan you this money. And we're going to really show you that this is a loan that's, that, that really is, is, you know, needs to be paid back. You know, it's not just words on paper. So um, it's not an idle promise. So they get the let's say there's a son and a daughter, their son borrows maybe $100,000 to get that down payment on a house, start a business, go on vacation, buy orthodontia for the kids, whatever. So they loan the money to their child, their son, and the son signs a note, says, okay, I promise to pay you back $100,000 with interest, blah, blah, blah. Here's the, here's the payment schedule and all. And the parent's going, great. Okay, here's $100,000. And later on, they realize that, okay, we you know, we're start, we got payments at the beginning, but now those payments are not coming along as, as often as they were. Uh, let's, uh, let's call up the son. Hey, what's going on? Oh yeah. Uh, we needed this. We needed to do that. Why well, I promise payment is coming. And, but the payments are not. And pretty soon the son's not coming around, not calling as much or at all. And, but even more significant, the son's not bringing his kids around to see grandma and grandpa. All because of the awkwardness of the unspoken subject of the fact that he's not paying everybody back. He's not paying back. So after a period of time, the parents say, we got to do something. We're just going to say, you know what? Forget it. I'm going to say, so son, you know what? All is forgiven. You don't have to pay it back. Okay. And the son goes, woohoo. You know, here's, you know, great. You know, life goes on. Okay, then the, parents, <laughs> then the parents die and they have a living trust that leaves their assets to you know, their son and daughter equally. Great, okay, son and daughter equally. But guess what? There's that note. It was never ripped up. Uh, it's, it's, it may have been sitting around in some file or some safety deposit box, but it may be yellowing with age and it may be dusty, but there it is. And a note to the parents where they're the beneficiaries. Um, that's just like any other asset that the parents have. It's like a house. It's like a bank account. It's an asset of the trust estate that is to be divided equally between their children. So when everything goes to the two kids, that means everything goes, everything includes that note or that loan that has not been paid back. So 
what happens? Well, now we have a creditor debtor situation between these two kids. You know, the son doesn't have to pay, you know, it doesn't have to pay himself back the half that would go to him because that because he's the creditor and the debtor and that merges together. But the sister is going to say, you know, you owe me one half of that. And that's would have been more to split if not for you. (laughs) Yeah, it is right. And and besides, you know, you owe me one half plus the interest. So now that fifty thousand that I'm entitled to is now something crazy, like maybe two hundred fifty thousand, whatever it is. Um, And also, you know, because the note's still here. And also, why should you have had the benefit of the money that you got to use from the mom and dad all that time? If they would have loaned me that money, I too would have had some equity in the house worth hundreds of thousands or a business, whatever. So. I'm enforcing that. And uh, the son says, well, you can't enforce that against me because, you know, the statute of limitations is run or whatever. Um, the point is here, now we've gone from, you know, the you know, son may have a point, depending on the terms of the note, uh, there may not be a courtroom solution to this, to the, uh, you know, for the daughter's problem of, in, uh, of enforcing this, th- th- this note. But we're not talking courtroom justice here. We're talking family justice. We're talking and siblings, it, not talking for a while. This is, yes. And I've seen this come up. Maybe there's been a note. Maybe there hasn't been a note. Maybe there's been a loan. It's been talked about. It's, it's, but, but loans, even if they're not on paper, they're still enforceable. Just depends on the terms of the note. And as long as there's proof of the loan, whether somebody's changed their position, whether there's been, you know, copies of checks that have been paid, you know, whatever, you can easily prove up a, the existence of a, of a promissory note or a loan. But the point is that, you have kids who ha- were pretty close before who now are not speaking to each other over a, a inadvertent unequal inheritance. And the reason why it's unequal is because the son got the benefit of the, of the, uh, of the loan during his lifetime. And now it's not being paid back or at least the daughter's not getting her share of the, uh, of the payback of that debt um, after the parents die. So, so the point is, don't let a don't let your a uh, one child be a debtor to another child. It's just going to screw up the relationship um, because money does funny things to people, Leah. You know, you can have the closest relationship between kids, but when money becomes involved, like in the division of an inheritance, you know, family loyalty goes out the window, and it's a whole new ball game. The kids won't speak to each other. The their their kids won't speak to you know each other. The grandchildren are not speaking to each other. And now you have a, 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 an irrevocable division in the family that will never be breached. And a lot of times the grandchildren are saying, well, gee, why are we never talking to that other side of the family? Yeah. And it goes on for, for, for a long time. Wow. So it, 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 forever. So this is the stuff of money. It's, um, you, know, you, you know, you can know somebody all your life. Um, you, know, you, you, know, you know somebody forever. But when money becomes involved, if you have a, a money relationship with the person, whether it's debt or creditor, whether it's sharing an inheritance, whether it's, um, you know, starting a business with somebody, you never really know that person until money becomes involved. That's when that's when true character is shown. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people there's a lot of estrangement out there in this arena, which is why getting back to one of my main points is is recognizing these issues that can come up to create this divisiveness in this, at least in the inheritance arena uh, and recognize those problems and come up with ways to resolve those problems. Um, But that is, uh, you know, using the inheritance plan to make sure that uh, at least from a parent's perspective, that work has been done to try to come up with solutions to make sure that the kids and a lot of those solutions involve involving the kids input. And, uh, but that is an anathema to a lot of people. A lot of people say, I don't want to bring my kids into the process of me doing this living trust or these inheritance instructions. I don't want to deal with them. I never talk to them about money. I, I don't want, uh, I don't want them involved. You know, we think that a lot of it is because, well, the kids are going to be unhappy if they find out what's really going on in that inheritance plan. And they, and the parents just don't want to face up to it. Now they say, Hey, after I'm dead, whatever. But there's there's several reasons why parents should bring their kids into the to the process. We think we think if not during it, at least after it, having a family meeting around the 
the, on Zoom these days right. or around the, you know, the officious looking lawyers conference room, not the officious looking lawyer. It's the lawyers <laughs> officious looking conference room. Right. Officious, you know, <laughs> so anyway, th there's a lot of reasons. There I got, I got chapters in my books about why you should bring your kids into the estate right. planning process. Yeah. In case so, anyone is tuning in a little later, then you know I want to say the name of your book again because I feel like it's so important that people go on. It's available on Amazon, I'm assuming, called yeah. Beyond the Grave. And you co-authored it with your dad, is that right? Yeah, yeah. It was, um, yeah, it was the, the, you know, on the first book, but there's two books. Okay. One is called Beyond the Grave. And the subtitle is The Right Way and the Wrong Way of Leaving Money to Your Children and Others. And my dad and I wrote it together. But back then it was my dad. You know, I was just, you know, just, you know, newbie lawyer. But and these but this book was uh, the stories and all were based on my dad's experiences How in his in his then like 30 something years of seeing of, of dealing with clients and seeing what happens with their estates after they die. You know, like I said, school of hard knocks. So. I wrote my dad's book. I was the English major at UCLA, go Bruins. Go Bruins, my daughter, Sari graduated last year from there. Oh, mazel tov, mazel tov, Leah. Um, but so anyway, long story short, I wrote the book in my dad's first person. And that book was, became the best-selling inheritance planning book in American publishing history. It helps to have Ann Landers mention your book in her cause. Yes. That really helped. It, it, it helped to be on. I think we're probably the only Jews to have ever been on the Pat Robertson show Amazing. because uh, because he, um, he 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 likes talking about um, using your inheritance plan to leave money to his 700 club. So he says, oh, what a great thing. I'm going to have condoms on and I can jump. I can use that as, as, as jumping off on, on that platform to talk about leaving money to the 700 club. He was a genius at raising money through inheritance dollars. Wow. Um, uh, but anyway, so we wrote that and then it was, uh, you know, it was revised. And so I think on that book, uh, it's now like in the fifth revised edition. And, uh, so it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it won't, uh, the, the book industry has something called remaindering. If your book is no longer selling, it gets remaindered. Our book has never been remaindered. I don't think it will, Ooh. because the topic is the topic of, of avoiding inheritance conflicts is an evergreen. It has no season. Um, but after that, after my dad passed, I wrote this one. And it's called The Living Trust Advisor. Everything you and your financial planner needs to know about your living trust. Love and it. Um, yeah, so, and so that's like uh, the second iteration of Beyond the Grave. Um, it's structured differently. It's got different stories in it and whatnot. But Anyway, there it is. You know, you're giving me a, a platform of which to plug my book. So how can I resist? You can't you know? resist. I think it's important. The stories really impact when you hear the stories and you, you can actually feel the emotions between the siblings. I mean, I'm one of 11. You know, we have wow. five kids. Yeah. And, and, and a grandson. And I could just imagine you'd never want to have that conflict when you're not here. The, the, you want to leave them behind. Like you said, sell, settle it all before because... Mm -hmm everything after you're gone has residual effects for mm -hmm. generations. And we could, if we could do everything in our power that we possibly can to avoid that, we need to find out what those things are. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things you mentioned before I'll get into some question answers, protecting the children's inheritance from their creditors. Yeah. Uh, their, you know, what happens when they get divorced or remarried? maybe touch upon that for the next couple minutes if that's okay yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. no it's not all right leah forget it how dare you how rude <laughs> I love it. yeah oh my gosh i'm gonna you know hang up now in, in a <laughs> huff uh let's see so this is a very this is a very important aspect uh because a lot of people forget that when they die that the assets that they've accumulated during their lifetime are going to wind up in the hands of their kids i know it's such an obvious thing but when it goes into the hands of their kids, it becomes subject to their children's problems in life. You know, bankruptcies, divorces, you know, um, you know accidents with insufficient insurance to their creditors, to their bankruptcies, to their income tax problems. You know, if they belong to a crazy cult, then you might wind up with that, you know, tithing to that particular cult. Right. Um, yeah. there's, a, there's just a laundry list of problems that, that, that pose risks of loss to our clients' assets that they work so hard to accumulate during their lives. 
uh, we just forget about that. Because once it's in the hands of their kids, they own it. The kids own it. Now what? Now the kids lose it to a divorce. That's not what our clients have in mind. So what we do now is we no longer leave. We no longer have our clients leave to their children an outright inheritance. Outright meaning, here you go, vaya con Dios, and you know, hope, you know, hope you don't screw it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, instead, we have the clients leave their in the, the inheritance of their children to their children in the form of something that uh, it, 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 it's it's a subtrust. It's a subtrust built within the body of their living trust. If the living trust is is a one big document, the subtrust is created within and established in and by that document. Okay. And that subtrust is called a protection trust. Protection trust. Okay. So that just depending upon the problem that the children have or may have that we're attempting to, pro to protect the, the inheritance against, right? that money and property, the, the, in, that inherited share will go in that protection trust with a trustee who will be in charge of that share, that share. And to that trustee is then charged with the duty of, of using the funds, the inheritance share in that subtrust, in that protection trust for the purposes set forth by the clients, the parents. So you could have the trustee saying that, okay, this share, this inherited share will go into my son's protection trust and my son will get all the income and my son will get all the principal for support and health and maintenance and education and, and what have you, you know, all the greatest hits in life, right? Medical, what have you. But then when my son dies, then the assets that are left over in that protection trust will go to my son's children without giving my son the power to divert those assets for improper purposes Whatever those are, could be, you know, you know, drugs, alcohol, crazy cults, whatever, you know, um, divorce, whatever. So that when my son dies, it must go to my grandchildren. And if my son doesn't have any grandchildren, to, to my other child. But if my other child, if I don't have another child or that other child is right. gone, then to my other child's kids. And if right. none, then to some charities or friends, whoever it is that the parents want to direct it to. Now, the question is, who's going to be the trustee? Who's going to be the one holding the money that was my next for question. those purposes? Well, most of the times it could be the child himself. I know that sounds inconsistent, but if we say to the son, you are the trustee of your own trust and you are legally obligated, legally, to ensure that the money and property is used in accordance with the terms and the provisions of this trust. So it says, you, son, trustee, can pay out the income to you, son, beneficiary. And you, son, as trustee, have the duty to pay out the principal and dip into principal for these appropriate purposes. Nice. But what doesn't, but what isn't an appropriate purpose? An appropriate purpose, an inappropriate purpose is giving it away or leaving it to a spouse or giving or, or giving it to a spouse or some guy walking down the street or using right. it for, you know, all of these, you know, these. You know, you, 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 it, it says you what you can do with it and anything that's, that doesn't fall in that list, you can't do. Now, the next question that somebody asked, well, if the son is in charge, who's going to be the one monitoring that son so that he is ensured to use it for those proper purposes? Well, this is this is where the real world kicks in. If the trust is revocable or irrevocable, then there are beneficiaries who do have the ability to say, hey, son, you're not allowed to do that. You just can't throw it in the street like that. Who are they? It's the beneficiary, legally speaking, it's the beneficiaries of that trust after the son dies. Okay. But those beneficiaries may be three years old. They may not be in a position to protect themselves. Right, right. But but this but this is the real world. This the real world is we don't want to tie the sun string hands with this. We don't want to tie his hands right. by limiting him to have to go to a third party trustee every time he wants to write a check so we can buy food at Ralph's. Right. You know, unless the son's a drug addict, 
or some, that he has some kind of problem that just makes it so readily apparent that he needs protection from himself, he's going to be his own trustee. If the problem that we're trying to protect against is making sure he doesn't blow it, you know, uh, doesn't, you know, lose it to a spouse by giving it to a spouse. Well, then we say to that son, this is why you're getting the part, the, the trust in the third, you know, in, in, the, in this manner. So that it sort of ties a string around your finger to yeah. make sure that you recognize this inheritance is, is precious property. It's property that you're inheriting from mom and dad. It's family, money, and property. And it's mom and dad's wish that it go down the bloodline instead of being diverted by your widow and then going into your widow's second spouse's kids from her first marriage, you know? So, right. yeah. So it's kind of a compromise. Yes, the son may have the ability to, because nobody's looking over his shoulder, no policeman looking over his shoulder, may have that ability, not authority, but ability to divert it. But legally speaking, when we say to the son, you have to use it for these purposes, that oftentimes, most of the time, that's enough to keep the son on the straight and narrow with regards right. to the usage of that inheritance. So that's a protection trust. And nine times out of 10, that's how my clients are going to, to leave their uh, children's inheritance in this type of protection trust. And that it's like, a, it's like, imagine like a castle wall that's built around that inheritance, whether that wall is super thin or whether it's super thick depends upon the type of problem that we're trying to protect against that poses a risk of loss to that inheritance once it's in the child's hands. So that's, that's how we deal with that. If the child has a lot of creditors, you know, that wall may be so thick where we have a third party trustee, where the third party is instructed that, that, uh, that, the, that the, he may discretion, he may pay income and principal to that child because in that situation, when the child has a lot of creditors, those creditors could end up with it all if the trustee actually has the mandatory duty of paying out income or principal to that child. So we'll leave it to that trust in, in a may relationship, may, you know, and the trustee's sole and absolute discretion may pay out something to, to that child. Because if it says may, then the creditors cannot, um, uh, cannot come in and then uh, take uh, right. uh, that child's inheritance. Wording is so important. Yeah. Anyway, so wow. yeah, it's, it's, I'm kind of all over the map on this, but the point is that is parents have to recognize that once that inheritance is inherited, by the kids, it becomes subject to the problems in those kids' lives. We have to draft now to protect it from that risk of loss. Sure, for sure. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah. I want to leave room for questions, but I also want to also put a little um, plug for next week because next week's show is I'm actually going to be interviewing my personal mentor, uh, Dina Michael. We're going to be talking about women and leadership, success principles, how to change your mindset from E to B, being an employee to a business owner. So tune in next week, the same time, um, if you're listening to this, but I wanted to give some- That sounds space. good. Thank you, yes. And I wanna mm -hmm. give some space for people um, to raise their hand or just come out with a question that you might have for Jeff at this time regarding estate planning. Yeah, or it might be crickets. Or it might be crickets. crickets. Or it might be crickets. Or it might they'll be say, crickets. They'll say, Jeff, Jeff, you stunned us into silence, respectful silence. We, we, we have no idea what, you know, uh, we're just, I don't know. I think you're giving a lot of people food for thought. It's, it's mm -hmm. really, it can be very devastating and it can go really smoothly. And there's a lot yeah. of in between. And so having someone to, to sit you down and, show you some of the negative things that have happened so we can learn from other people's mistakes. I mean, why do you think most mm -hmm. of this stuff happens? Because it's been done and it's happened and we want to avoid those things. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, no, that's absolutely right. When our book was, when we submitted our book and it was after it was accepted after, after it was accepted for publication, um, the powers that be at HarperCollins got involved and said, we really want you to eliminate the part where you're admitting that you made certain mistakes because that's because the reader wants to know that he, that uh, he or she has a lot of faith in the author and the authors never make mistakes because you're supposed to come across as authoritative and what have you. We said, well, you might as well just, we might as well just give you our advance back and cancel this because the whole point of this book is learning from our previous mistakes and making sure that that stuff, or at least we try to draft so that the, that the problems that was a result of our mistakes never come up again. 
Uh, we won that. We, we won the day on that one. But um, okay. well, yeah, Leah, and, I'm going uh, to yes. chime in here, um, Jeff. First of all, I want everybody on the um, on in the meeting to know I put a link to your book on Amazon in the chat. Yeah. And also I put a link to your website in the chat. So if people want to be Very able nice. to get a copy of your book or get in touch with you, that's in the chat. And then we have a question from Marie Carroll. Jeff, okay. she asks, how early on in life should we do a trust? Oh, okay. Well, that boy, that's that's a great question. Uh, uh, the first thing is a determination has to be made as to whether you even need it, because you know, uh, you know, we're not going to sell you something you don't need. It's one of the reasons why the first consultation is free. I can't charge you a fee to tell you what the fee is going to be. So if you come in and I say, not nah, a simple will will just be fine, you know, and or you don't need anything at all. Hey, that's great. Then you know that's part of the deal. You come in so I can assess. So, and so just to let you know, if anybody's going to go out there and go to a lawyer that for, for estate planning, that first consultation really should be free because it's not ethical in my mind to charge someone a fee just to tell them what the fee is going to be. But let's, let's say that, um, but the general rule is if you have real estate, you should have a living trust. If you have real estate, you should have a living trust. That's a general rule of thumb. Um, but, uh, uh, but when, you know, I've had clients in their 20s who have been extremely fortunate to be, uh, you know, to be quite wealthy. Um, and so I've done, done it for 20 year olds, but the, the, the bread and butter of my practice is I'm dealing with folks who are in their fifties and sixties and seventies. And that's when they've, you know, accumulated the wealth that they're going to have from a starting point, from an estate planning perspective. Um, uh, I guess, I guess the answer is, you come in when you want and let the lawyer, between the lawyer and you, we come up with the decision as to what it is that you need and, and when you should need it. Right. Simple she as asked that. a further question because her daughter is purchasing a home with her boyfriend. Should her daughter think about having a living trust because she's now gonna have a property with, so actually because she's not married to him, it probably makes a lot of sense, but I'm not the expert. Uh, I would say, <laughs> I would say don't purchase the property in joint tenancy with your boyfriend. Because now anytime you want to wheel and deal with that property, you're going to have to have everybody consenting or participating to any transaction. Also, if you purchase it in joint tenancy, if she purchases it, then if something, God forbid, happens to her, her boyfriend's going to end up with it all. Maybe that's OK. But on the other hand, you know, because that's joint tenancy by right of survivorship, surviving joint tenant wins, gets it all. So my recommendation is that if she's going to go into a partnership with her boyfriend, that she should have her share purchased in the name. Of, well, it could be purchased in her name, but then she should transfer her half to a living trust, which says that on her passing, her share will go to the people that she wants it to go to. Even if she wants it to go to her boyfriend, that's okay. But maybe she wants it to go to her boyfriend for his life. And then maybe then on his death, then that half, after he's done using it because he's no longer alive, then it goes to her people. But, um, but also, but as an aside, and this isn't really anything about estate planning, you know, if you're going into partners and in property with anybody, you really should have some type of type of agreement that speaks to the duties and the obligations of all the partners, because, you know, it, you know, it may be wind up where she winds up saying, Hey, I'm going to, you know, pay the property taxes. What are you going to pay? Well, you know, he should be obligated to pay one half of the property taxes. There really needs to be an agreement spelled out. I know this sounds like, you know, some lawyer trying to get some business. I'm telling you right now, it, the, 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 whatever you're paying a lawyer to do uh, to, in order to um, execute this, in order, in order to draft an, a property agreement between partners is going to pale in comparison to the lawyer's fees that are going to ensue when the problems of joint ownership ensue. Wow. So, so there you go. <laughs> a lot of lessons learned right there that are so valuable. Love. <laughs> it's so romantic to buy a house together. <laughs> We're so in love. Until, all right, now you have this home and, and, and it, it could be very sticky and, and people mm -hmm. think it's so unromantic to, to do these pa this paperwork, but the truth is it's mm -hmm. the most romantic because you care so much about what could happen if, and you never want someone you love to have to go through such 
heartache and headache and hassle that could really be going through hoops and courts and, you know, um, mm -hmm. yeah. and, probate and who knows what. So I agree. Thank you so much, Jeff. This was so fun. And I hope that I brought a lot of value to all of you um, having Jeff as a guest, because these are the things that we don't always get around to doing. We don't mm -hmm. love discussing. We procrastinate on these topics. But what the goal of for these weekly shows is to bring you into ideas and conversations that you may have been thinking about having, but we're, we're just afraid of what's on the other side, but to make it more fun and mm -hmm. uh, doable. And I appreciate you all for taking part in today. Thank you, Rabbi Kevin. And thank you, Jeff. And have a phenomenal rest of your week, everyone. A great weekend. And we'll see you next week on the way to wow, Thursday at one o'clock Pacific. Have a great day. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye now. Mm -hmm.